Calls grow for a four-day working week as thousands of people sign a petition for shorter hours. Taiwan's legislature passes a landmark amendment to expand adoption rights for same-sex couples. Amnesty International says executions were up by more than 50 percent worldwide last year. Plus, a hairy solution to mopping up oil spills at sea. Well, and welcome to Taiwan Plus News. I'm Ian Kavat. Taiwan's main opposition party, the Kuomintang, or KMT, is set to nominate new Taipei mayor, Hou Youyi, as its candidate for next year's presidential election. That's according to a report from Bloomberg. Hou's nomination is expected to be confirmed on Wednesday by party chair Eric Zhu. Events supporting his main rival, billionaire businessman Terry Gore, were cancelled on Tuesday. This further fueled speculation that Ho is the nominee. A spokesperson for the KMT declined to comment on the report. Two online petitions calling for a four-day work week and shorter working days have crossed the 5,000 signature threshold. This means the government will have to discuss whether or not they are viable options, being one reports. Real estate agent Cho Shen is finishing things off at work in preparation for his three-day weekend. His company implemented a four-day work week where employees only work Monday to Thursday and have Friday to Sunday off. The idea of a four-day week is gaining traction in Taiwan. An online petition calling for a three-day weekend passed the 5,000 signature threshold, which means the government must consider the issue and have a response to it within a month. Another petition put before the government called for a six- or seven-hour workday instead of the current eight. Even universities are thinking about cutting back on required attendance time and switching to a four-day school week. Penn says courses will still be taught the same and teacher salaries won't be cut. But not everyone is on board with the idea of a four-day work week especially in the service industry. Five-day work weeks have been the norm for almost 100 years. It would take a big overhaul to switch to four days a week. But if Cho's company's success is any indication, that long-established convention may soon be broken. James Lin and Bing Wong for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan's legislature has passed an amendment to the country's same-sex marriage law. The change will allow LGBTQ couples to adopt a non-relative child. Taiwan legalized same-sex marriage in 2019, but the law did not grant LGBTQ couples joint custody over an adopted child. This prevented couples from receiving certain benefits, like parental leave. Laws laying out adoption measures for LGBTQ couples will be the same as those outlined in Taiwan's civil code. For more on what the new same-sex adoption amendment means for Taiwan's LGBTQ rights, our reporter Joyce Zheng spoke with Fang Qi, public policy director at a civil partnership rights advocacy group in Taipei. What's the significance of Taiwan ruling to allow LGBTQ couples to adopt non-relative children? After four years of efforts, today our government finally passed the third reading of the bill allowing same-sex couples to adopt non-blood-related children. We can see that our government and the lawmakers from different political parties have made efforts to facilitate it. Following the full legalization of transnational same-sex marriage in January this year, uh, Taiwan has taken another big step towards marriage equality. Before this law, what were the options available to LGBTQ couples to adopt? 
Are same-sex marriage act only allow one spouse to adopt the biological child of、uh, of the other spouse, but did not permit the adoption of stepchildren or non-blood related children? And this forced same-sex couples with adopted children to be legally recognized as single parents. Which completely disregarded the best interest of the children. This milestone it allows、uh, future generations in Taiwan, regardless of their sexual orientation, to adopt children without a blood relationship and grow up in loving families. Are there challenges that remain to achieve civil partnership equality in Taiwan? Although transnational same-sex marriage has been partially legalized, Taiwanese are still excluded. From the current legal framework, when it comes to marrying Chinese citizens, while this is a significant victory for the LGBTQ community, there is still rooms for further progress, like、um, 两岸同婚、人工生殖、婚生推定，以及呃、uh, 同婚回归民法 And we will continue our efforts to advocate for change. That was Joyce Zhang speaking with Fang Qi of the Taiwan Alliance to promote civil partnership rights. Taiwan's military says its amphibious support ship, the Yusan, will enter service in June. The domestically built warship is one of the country's largest and will carry supplies and personnel to outlying islands. In wartime, the ship can transport landing craft, missile batteries, and troops. The Yusan is named after Taiwan's highest mountain. And is the first of four ships in its class to be completed. Chinese authorities have detained a South Korean soccer player on suspicion of accepting bribes. Son Jun Ho is a South Korean so- soccer player who played for his country at the 2022 World Cup. He currently plays for Shandong Taishan Football Club in China. The South Korean consulate in the city of Shenyang says authorities in the northeastern province of Liaoning detained Son last week. A Category Five cyclone hit Myanmar and Bangladesh on Sunday, leaving widespread destruction. Scientists have warned that cyclones like this could become more common as the effects of climate change and rising sea temperatures increase. Harrell Hughes reports. This is the aftermath of Cyclone Maka, one of the strongest cyclones to hit the region in recent years. The storm landed on the coastline of western Myanmar and southern Bangladesh on Sunday. The damage is extensive. Myanmar's western Rakhine state was hit the hardest. Winds there were reported to have reached up to 210 kilometers per hour. Now a disaster zone, state media reports damage to homes, schools, health facilities, and communication towers in the capital city of Sitwe. Some reports say that up to 90 percent of the city has been destroyed. Down communication lines make it difficult to assess the number of deaths, which could be in the hundreds. Dur koye zee, ami dor bishti dekhi nai batash. Erom dekhi nai kal ke zee batash mar zilo, zee bishti di zilo. Ami koko no dekhi nai. In Bangladesh, the storm avoided the world's largest refugee camp in Cox's Bazar. The camp houses close to a million people. Most of whom are Rohingya Muslims fleeing from persecution in neighboring Myanmar. Volunteers and aid groups have worked to warn residents to be ready. Over 750,000 people were evacuated or sheltered where they could. The winds tore through hundreds of makeshift houses and shelters and have left thousands without homes. So far, three people have been reported dead. Humanitarian groups and the ruling military in Myanmar are working to distribute aid. But the problem goes much deeper. Category five cyclones have been increasing throughout the world. Climate experts point to rising heat levels in the ocean, which allow storms to sustain themselves and even get stronger as they move. We have again broken new record in ocean heat、uh, heat content, which is, for example, giving more energy for the tropical storms,、uh, cyclones,、uh, hurricanes, and、uh, and、uh, typhoons. Before Cyclone Maka made landfall. The United Nations estimated that six million people in this area were already in need of humanitarian assistance. As the effects of climate change worsen, 
the most marginalized communities look set to bear the brunt of the storm. Devin Tsai and Harrell Hughes for Taiwan Plus. Executions rose globally by 53% in 2022. That's according to an annual report on worldwide death sentences and executions by Amnesty International. Countries that reportedly carried out the most executions last year were Iran, Saudi Arabia, and China. The report lists China as, having like, as most likely having the highest number of state-sanctioned killings in 2022. However, this cannot be fully verified as China does not publish official data on executions. Taiwan is also listed in the report. The country sentenced three people to death last year, but has not executed anyone in two years. For more on the Amnesty International report and Taiwan's relationship with the death penalty, Taiwan Plus reporter Jeremy Olivier spoke with Cho Yiling, executive director of Amnesty International Taiwan. So according to this new report, um, global executions rose by 50% in 2022. Uh, what are the reasons for this very large rise? Last year, there are um, 20 um, countries uh, uh, executed the death penalty, and many 90% um, of the executions related to the drug-related um, crimes. So, um, and it's all about like the international human rights law because according to the um, international human rights law and the UN um, conventions, um, it's only the most serious crime. Um, could be um, use the death penalty um, as the punishment. Uh, Taiwan is listed in this report as uh, a country that has kept its death penalty. Um, why has Taiwan not gotten rid of this practice, even though it uh, maintains these commitments to protecting human rights? We still see that the um, Taiwanese um, um, government uh, keep using the um, you know, the majority supports um, the um, death penalty as a reason and an excuse to postpone all these um, steps toward the abolishment. So, um, yeah, and, and also in the past, we keep seeing that many uh, politicians or the ruling parties, they will use the executions um, when they get the lower support from the um, voters or uh, when during the elections. So even though Taiwan uh, continues to sentence people to death, it hasn't actually performed any executions in two years. Is putting these kinds of temporary uh, moratoriums or halts on executions a good approach for Taiwan? We should consider about um, the implementation of, of a moratorium. Um, but we, um, we also um, know that um, if we um, have a moratorium for a long time, it's also will cause another issue um, that the death row, they will um, you know, um, served in the prison for many years, like more than decades. Um, so that will be another inhuman and uh, crucial um, treatment. I think the, the next step is, is still um, you know, to um, to move toward the abolishment and also thinking about um, how to um, you know, um, to, to, tr to transform the criminals into a, a new person through our, um, our um, correction um, mechanism through our prison. That was Amnesty International Taiwan Director Cho Yiling speaking with Taiwan Plus reporter Jeremy Olivier. A recent report says Taiwan faced the most cyber attacks of any country in the first part of 2023, more after the break. For more stories from Taiwan and around the world, download the Taiwan Plus app and follow us on social media. Welcome back. You're watching Taiwan Plus News. 
Taiwan's legislature has passed amendments to its criminal code, increasing the severity of punishment for fraud and human trafficking. This comes after several criminal groups were busted for activities that resulted in the deaths of some of their victims. Sam Robbins reports. Taiwan is set to issue more severe punishments for acts of kidnapping, human trafficking and fraud. If someone kidnaps a person and causes injuries, they could be sentenced to between 5 and 12 years in prison. If the kidnapped person dies, the kidnapper could be sentenced to 10 years to life in prison. The change comes after a slew of cases involving human trafficking in Taiwan. In some cases, fraud rings would lure people to other countries with promises of high-paying jobs. But upon arrival, they discover they were being trafficked and would be forced to give up their passports. They'd then be coerced to do illegal work, such as scamming people online. In November last year, 58 people were rescued by police in New Taipei City and Taoyuan after being imprisoned by a kidnapping ring. This is one of just many cases involving human trafficking and fraud. Taiwan's officials hope the toughest sentences will deter fraud rings and help put a stop to these illegal activities. Klein Wong, Bing Wong and Sam Robbins for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan has passed a new law to fight deep fake images and audio. The new amendment makes it a crime to create and disseminate computer-generated fakes. Violators could face up to seven years in prison and a fine of up to one million NT dollars. That's over 30,000 US dollars. Last year, a YouTuber created deep fake pornographic videos using the likeness of over 100 people, some of them public figures. The incident led officials to propose updates to the criminal code to address rapidly developing technology. Taiwan saw the most cyber attacks of any country in early 2023. That's according to a report by an American-Israeli software company. The report says Taiwan experiences over 3,000 attacks per organization each week, more than two and a half times the global average. Taiwan's digital ministry set up a new office earlier this year to improve the country's cybersecurity. The legislature also passed a law on Tuesday that fines private companies up to 500,000 US dollars if they leak private data. For more on the challenges to Taiwan's cybersecurity, Sam Robbins spoke to Yachi Chiang, president of the Taiwan Law and Technology Association. Why does Taiwan experience so many cyber attacks? China is certainly the key word of Taiwan's cyber attacks. Uh, according to the report, uh, China accounted for more than 60% of Taiwan's cyber attacks annually. And also during last year's Pelosi visit, we see the uh, number of the cyber attacks in Taiwan increase many, many folds. So what is the Taiwanese government doing to try to prevent some of these cyber attacks? I think the cyber attacks, we can look at the, uh, this question from two aspects. And one category of the cyber attacks is national sponsored cyber attacks from China. And the other category is uh, the cyber attacks to the individuals. In terms of the cyber attacks against the individuals or the private organizations, we see that the government, the administrative yuan, they just announced the combating the online fraud version 1.5. And they say that they are going to increase the penalties against these cyber criminals. And also they are heightening the cooperations between different apartments so that to speed up the reporting of these crimes and also speed up the actions against these criminals. I'm sure that would be helpful to fight against the cyber crimes. Do you think Taiwan needs to do more to combat cyber crime? Well, I think certainly Taiwan needs to do more to combat the cyber crimes. And it takes not only the public sector's efforts, it also takes the efforts from the private sector. I think the legal standards need, needs to be uh, heightened. I, I think we need to have more legal provisions to make sure that these private sectors, their actions also they adhere to the legal standards. So uh, in my view, I think uh, the public sector, they should work with the private sector. That was Sam Robbins talking to Yanqi Jiang of the Taiwan Law and Technology Association. 
A Pakistan court has released the wife of former Prime Minister Imran Khan on bail until May 23rd. Bushra Bibi faces accusations of corruption along with her husband. Imran Khan was arrested last week, prompting violent protests across the country. Shortly afterwards, Pakistan's Supreme Court ordered that he be released on bail for two weeks. More than 100 legal cases have been registered against Imran Khan since Pakistan's parliament vote did to remove him from power last year. As leaders of the G7 nations prepare to meet in Japan, it's been hard to ignore the ongoing debt ceiling standoff in the U.S. Congress. The U.S. government stands to run out of money next month, but House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has said talks to find a solution are not in a good place. This could play into the hands of the country's geopolitical rivals. Joyce Tsung explains. U.S. government debt. It's viewed by many as one of the safest investment options in the world, an anchor for the global financial system. But now that assumption is under threat. The notion of defaulting on our debt is something that would so badly undermine um, the U.S. and global economy that I think it should be regarded by everyone as unthinkable. That unthinkable is coming closer to reality. The U.S. hit its debt limit again in January and has resorted to extraordinary measures to maintain government payments, which are quickly running out. Congress is divided on how to proceed, and if it fails to act, Washington could be forced to default on its debts as early as June 1st, an unprecedented declaration that the U.S. government has run out of money. First and foremost, that would cause hardship for millions of Americans, and Washington's geopolitical rivals could seek to capitalize on the chaos. Both Russia and China would look to perceive, uh, you know, sort of narrate through information operations such a, an event as demonstrating the chaos within the United States that we're not capable of functioning as a democracy. And Since 2009, the United States government has spent about a trillion dollars over its budget each year. It must borrow money to meet all of its commitments, like national defense, health care, and paying government workers. The debt ceiling is the total amount of money its federal government can borrow. In January 2023, this stood at $31.4 trillion. If more money is needed, Congress can raise the debt ceiling and authorize extra cash. It's done so countless times before. A U.S. default would send shockwaves through the global economy, a fear that's looming over a group of seven leaders as they gather for the main summit in Hiroshima this week. It would also jeopardize another key component of American financial supremacy, the U.S. dollar. The dollar underpins U.S. debt and is the most widely used currency in international trade. Over half of the world's foreign currency reserves are held in U.S. dollars, but even this so-called economic stabilizer is on the line. Instability of the dollar could plunge the world into a financial crisis, but superpower rivals like China may stand to benefit. Beijing has been aspiring to make the renminbi the next global currency, something that would strengthen their economy's resilience. Some have already bought in. Last month, Argentina, which is heavily indebted to the U.S., said it would begin using China's currency to pay for Chinese imports. Sentimos que estamos viviendo un momento histórico, eh, un cambio histórico a nivel de lo que es la internacionalización del renminbi y la fuerza que va a empezar a cobrar. Beijing previously seized on the global financial crisis of 08 as evidence that the U.S. shouldn't be the leader of the world's economy. The current standstill in Washington over how to avoid an unprecedented default could cause irreparable damage to his reputation at the cost of the global financial system. Kama Shu, James Chater and Joyce Zen for Taiwan Plus. Oil spills are major ecological disasters that must be painstakingly cleared. But what if the solution was growing on all of us? Sandy Chi takes a look at a surprising material being used for cleanups. Getting a haircut is a chance to relax for many. But have you ever thought, what happens to all that hair once it's swept up? Most salons dispose these clingings along with other garbage, now realizing it has special properties that are perfect for environmental protection. Hair 
An NGO in Belgium says that one kilogram of hay can absorb 7 to 8 liters of oil in 5 to 10 minutes. The absorption can have an even greater effect when the temperature is between 0 and 25 degrees Celsius. The sustainable resource has already been used in many parts of the world to tackle oil leaks at sea. In 2022, the citizens of Peru donated hair to help with an oil spill of around 6,000 barrels after the volcanic eruption in Tonga. While hair can help clean up spills, it's not a miracle cure. Oil-soaked hair does have another sustainable advantage, though. It can be turned into compost, helping turn environmental disasters into food for the future. Howard Zhang and Sani Chi for Taiwan Plus. Bird lovers in Kaohsiung are taking turns to guard a family of rare black-naped orioles from poachers. The family's nest was spotted in a tree in the southern city, close to Kaohsiung City Council. Taiwan's local subspecies of black-naped oriole has become endangered due to habitat loss and poaching. Fewer than 200 are believed to survive in the wild. Though protected, the colorful songbirds are popular with collectors and can fetch up to 650 US dollars on the black market. Volunteers have been watching over the nest in shifts after a possible poacher was spotted near the area with a pole and net. The city council also says it will do its best to protect the birds. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. Finally today, we leave you with images of the kabaya blouse. Commonly worn in Southeast Asia, several countries jointly nominated the garment to be on the UN's intangible cultural heritage list. I mean, Kavat, take care and see you next time.